For many years, we lived in Flagstaff, Arizona, and in Flagstaff, it getting very cold in winter. And so when it was too cold to go outside, we would take my young son, Josh, as a toddler, down to the Flagstaff Mall. Of course, it had department stores, but it also had a food court. It had a pet store where he enjoyed looking at the animals so much that we called it the Flagstaff Zoo. Of course, he loved the toy store as well, but there was just plenty of room for a toddler to run out a bunch of energy without getting frostbite. The Flagstaff Mall is where he first sat on Santa's lap. It's where he went to his first Halloween parade that first year we dressed him as a skunk and called him Little Stinker. It was a place where we had a lot of fond memories as a young family. Well, Josh is all grown up now. He has a daughter of his own, and we haven't lived in Flagstaff in years, and yet I was still sad last spring when I saw a headline in the Arizona Sun that read, Can Flagstaff Mall Make It in a Shifting Retail Environment? You know, for decades, malls were a centerpiece of American culture, but since the 2000s, a new term has arisen. Dead malls. The rise and fall of the American mall is history that deserves to be remembered. Merriam-Webster Online defines a mall as an urban shopping area featuring a variety of shops surrounding a usually open-air concourse reserved for pedestrian traffic. But to understand the idea of a modern shopping mall, it helps to first understand the entire idea of a mall. Webster's explains that the name is derived from an Italian long game originally called Palamalio, which means roughly ball and mallet. King James I introduced the game to England in the 17th century, where it was called Pal Mall and was considered a predecessor to croquet. The game was played along a stretch of green that was referred to as a mall. These open spaces over time developed into essentially public parks where people could walk and socialize. An example is a street in central London simply called the Mall that connects Buckingham Palace to Trafalgar Square via the Admiralty Arch. The term has remained, and some cities still call green spaces or spaces for walking malls, with, of course, a U.S. example being the National Mall in Washington, D.C., which stretches between the U.S. Capitol and the Washington Monument. But another example of an early mall is the street in central London called Pal Mall, which connects St. James's Street to Trafalgar Square, and which has, since the 18th century, been a street that is known for its high-end shopping, as well as gentlemen's clubs. Thus, the term, oddly derived from the word mallet, has for some centuries referred to a public space to socialize and shop, and thus its natural application, as Merriam-Webster Online explains. In the mid-20th century, the word was applied to a variety of public spaces, ranging from an outdoor concourse between buildings to, you guessed it, the gargantuan complex off the highway where seas of cars wait in parking lots for their owners to emerge, bag-laden and weary, with shopping halls and no thoughts of Pall Mall at all. The website Away With Words explains this last evolution. In the 1950s, the word mall was applied to streets that were closed off to make shops convenient for pedestrians. Later, mall was used to denote complexes built specifically for shopping and located outside of urban centers. But of course, the general idea long predates the 1950s. Smithsonian Magazine wrote in 2014, A one-stop shop where people could pick up a bite to eat or chat with friends from across town was never an intrinsically American idea preceded by the Roman Forum and the Greek Agora and medieval market towns. The mall also owes a debt to the 19th century department store, where brands like Sears and Macy's taught a newly urban America to become very comfortable with conspicuous consumerism. Shopping as a centralized social experience tracks back at least to medieval market towns, towns which had a special charter that allowed them to hold periodic markets, which distinguished them from villages and cities. The number of market towns grew quickly, starting in the 12th century as cities grew and cash-based economies developed. Historian James Davis of Queen's University, Belfast, describes a medieval market in his 2012 book, Medieval Market Morality. The marketplace was the accepted physical location where regular economic, social, cultural, and political interchanges took place and attitudes were readily formed. It facilitated a dynamic congregation of professional traders, marginal retailers, part-time hucksters, peasant producers, and sundry consumers, who created a hive of haggling, shouting, and gossip. Given that the book is describing medieval markets between 1200 and 1500, that's actually a pretty fair description of American malls in the 1980s and 90s, even if it was lacking an orange Julius in a sunglasses hut. In fact, large department stores, which existed since the 18th century, fittingly one of the earliest, Harding & Howell Company opened in 1796 on Pall Mall, bear a strong resemblance to modern shopping malls. 
In a 2015 edition of BBC Culture, author Jonathan Glancy asserts that the design of such stores was influenced by the Crystal Palace, built for the London Great Exhibition in 1851. Not only did the Crystal Palace feature 300,000 panes of plate glass, a recent invention, but it was also an enormous showcase of consumer goods from around the world. Ever since, even when clad in marble, stone, brick, or terracotta, department stores, shopping malls too, have something of Paxton's Crystal Palace about them. And while there's a difference between a suburban mall and a department store, still a description of a 19th century Berlin department store by historian Leo Kotz again sounds very like a mall from the 80s or 90s. To the right and left, one show window after another displays luxuries for ladies and gentlemen alike. An elegant stream of people, full of cheer, with all the time in the world, laughs and flirts its way down the street. So the shopping malls that became centers of culture in the 80s and 90s were part of a consumer culture that had grown over time, but they were also products of their time. The development of the department store was intimately tied to the Industrial Revolution and a growing middle class. Glancy writes that the customers for the early department stores, for the main part, were newly affluent middle class women. Their good fortune and the department store itself nurtured and shaped by the Industrial Revolution. Built by merchants who understood the tastes and buying power of the rising new generation of middle class women that, for the second half of the 19th century, would spur the department store to opulent heights across Europe and the United States. Much like medieval market towns, the new development in shopping represented a transformation of culture. The development of the suburban mall was also driven by new trends in both culture and the economy. Business Insider explained the rise of the 20th century shopping mall. The middle of the century was uniquely primed for the advent of the shopping mall. The birth of the interstate highway system meant the suburbs were growing at warp speed and people had more money to spend post-World War II. The website of West Hollywood's Sunset Plaza argues that the Bellevue Shopping Square in Washington opened in 1946 and the Town and Country Village and Broadway Crenshaw Center in California were the first American suburban malls, but also writes that, however, the 1950s were a time of redefining malls. Northgate in Washington and Shopping World in Massachusetts set the stage. Both featured shopping centers anchored by downtown department stores. Shoppers World was also the first two-level center. But Business Insider writes that the nation's first fully enclosed indoor mall opened on October 8, 1956. Called Southdale Center, the shopping mall was located in the suburbs of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and contained shops, fountains, art installations, a courtyard, and a bird sanctuary. Smithsonian wrote that after Southdale's 1956 opening, journalists decreed that the vision of retail it embodied had become part of the American way. Southdale Center was designed by Austrian-American architect Victor Gruen, described as a pioneer in shopping center design. Gruen had fled Nazi Germany and arrived in the United States in 1938. The newspaper California Local said of him, he spoke no English, and yet less than two decades later, Victor Gruen created what would become one of the most enduring elements and symbols of American post-war consumer capitalism, the shopping mall. The opening in 1956 might come itself as a surprise. Despite the long history of markets and shopping, the malls that so define many of our childhoods are a relatively new development. Sunset Plaza remarks, That's right. Enclosed malls have been around for less than 60 years, meaning your grandparents might be older than the first enclosed mall. But the idea took off quickly for many reasons. Sunset Plaza notes the high demand for housing meant a high demand for retail stores. An increase in cars also meant a need for places that could temporarily house all those vehicles. But there was more to it. In 1956, American tax law accelerated the rate at which a developer could deduct for depreciation. Malcolm Gladwell explained in a 2004 edition of The New Yorker, Suddenly, it was possible to make much more money investing in things like shopping centers than buying stocks, so money poured into real estate investment companies. Business Insider reported that changing tax laws made it lucrative to invest in commercial real estate, leading to shopping centers springing up across the country. For example, six new shopping plazas were built in or near downtown Cortland, New York, between 1950 and 1970, even though the population had hardly budged. By 1960, Business Insider writes, there were 4,500 large shopping complexes in the U.S., meaning an average of at least three new shopping centers had opened every day since 1956. By the mid-1970s, 33% of all U.S. retail sales happened at a mall or shopping center. A decade later, that number had grown to 52%. Smithsonian notes that eventually the American fascination with malls hit a feverish peak. In 1990, 19 new malls opened across America. The New York Times noted in 2022, it's hard to argue against the mall as a ubiquitous feature of post-war America. 
and the importance of malls continued to grow. Business Insider notes that by 1986, there were 25,000 shopping malls nationwide and become de facto town squares. The mall was where teens hung out and where single people met for dates. Music and movies glamorized and skewered the mall in equal measure, while Consumer Reports named it one of the top 50 inventions that had revolutionized consumer life, alongside innovations like antibiotics and birth control pills. And Smithsonian Magazine wrote in 2014 for countless Americans, especially those who came of age in the post-war years, malls were the new town square, a place to shop, eat, gather, and meander. Sociologist Karen Sternhauser wrote on her personal blog in 2018, When I was a teen in the 1980s, the shopping mall was the center of social life. It was a regular gathering place for people my age. It was one of the few places to go that was free unless you decided to buy something. Parents certainly felt like it was safe and we might see other kids our age there. Remember, there was no email, no internet, and no social media. So aside from the telephone, hanging out was the only way to socialize. Smithsonian writes that malls produced a bevy of microcultures, from mall rats to mall walkers. Mall culture became pop culture, moving its way into music, movies, television. Time magazine recalled nostalgically it was the home of first jobs and blind dates, the place for family photos and ear piercings, where goths and grandmothers could somehow walk through the same doors and find something they all liked. While anyone who grew up in mall culture has their mall, perhaps the greatest symbol was the opening in 1992 of the Mall of America near Minneapolis, a 5.6 million square foot mall housing over 500 stores. Business Insider writes that a decade after Mall of America opened, it was drawing 43 million visitors every year, reported about $900 million in annual sales. Such very large shopping centers are called mega malls. And then the decline. Smithsonian notes that the last new enclosed mall was built in 2006. 2007 marked the first time since the 1950s that a new mall wasn't built in the United States. Between 2007 and 2009, 400 of America's largest 2,000 malls closed. Writing about a mall in Maryland in 2015, the New York Times noted that the Owings Mills Mall is poised to join a growing number of what real estate professionals, architects, urban planners, and internet enthusiasts term dead malls. Since 2010, more than two dozen enclosed shopping malls have been closed, and an additional 60 are on the brink, according to Green Street Advisors, which tracks the mall industry. The market research firm Gitnux writes that in 2020, estimated total shopping center sales were $385.7 billion, down from $495.3 billion the year before, with 9,300 stores closing across the United States during this time period alone. Now people face the odd specter of seeing the mall where they hung out with friends or had the first kiss, abandoned like some spooky movie set. The financial website IPX1031 wrote in 2023, Closed down malls are a familiar sight for many, as 68% of Americans live within one hour of a dead mall, and two in five live near two or more dead malls. A dead mall is a shopping mall with a high vacancy rate, low consumer traffic level, or abandoned altogether. As for completely shuttered spaces, 28% of Americans had an abandoned mall torn down where they live in the last five years. In 2002, when Nick Igalanian, president of retail consulting firm, told the Wall Street Journal, 10 years from now, there will be approximately 150 malls left in the United States. So what happened? Well, there are many explanations. Part of it has to do with the reason so many were built, tax write-offs. Smithsonian writes that investors, hoping to pull as much money as possible through short-term depreciation, weren't interested in improving pre-existing malls. Increasingly run down and redundant, malls started turning into ghost towns, first losing shoppers and then losing stores. Consumer habits were changing as well. Business Insider writes that department stores had lost their cachet, replaced by one-stop shops like Walmart. Consumers started buying things from catalogs and TV shopping channels rather than strolling through the mall for pleasure. New generations simply didn't see them all the same way the previous generations did. The Los Angeles Times wrote in 2017, The mall, suburbia's one-time lifestyle nexus for giant pretzels, ear piercings, and a girl's first thong, is battling a decline in cultural relevance as the social meeting place for young Americans continues to transition from physical spaces to phone screens. Determined to set their own traditions, millennials are pursuing for fashion online, at independent boutiques, and on Instagram. But in malls? Not as much. Perhaps it was just an issue of relevance. The Los Angeles Times opines it, but the homogenous familiarity has also contributed to many malls winning pertinence. Their contents have often become too detached from local community life and are easily accessed on the internet. They continue. 
The mall, in its heyday, was a portal to the lifestyles to which people could aspire, a stomping ground for discovery. This function, however, is now far better, faster, and more diversely fulfilled by Instagram. To be fair, there are more and more newspaper stories that are saying that the declaration of the death of the American mall might have been premature. Of course, many malls are still open, and newspapers note that retail sales have recovered some since the COVID closures, and many of those malls that were once called dead malls have reinvented themselves in various ways. But if the mall isn't completely dead, it certainly might be the end of mall culture. We're simply not the same sort of consumers that we were when malls were featured prominently in popular movies like Fast Times at Ridgemont High and Back to the Future and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. But we miss them. A 2023 IPX survey found that nearly half of Americans say that they miss going to the mall and one in 10 say that mall closures have impacted their social life. And perhaps more importantly, we want to see them come back. Same survey found that nearly two in three Americans say that they would like to see a revival of the traditional mall, suggesting that the shopping experience that was such an important part of our history might find its place in our future. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop for book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 